I thank the chair and welcome to our four expert witnesses. A special welcome to Dr. Peter Hotez. I'd like to join my Texas colleague, Mrs. Fletcher, in bragging about Dr. Hotez. My colleagues need to know this is not just a man who's an expert in Texas. He's a recognized expert in all of America and globally on pandemic viruses. And that's why you saw him all day yesterday on national cable explain the challenges with the COVID-19 virus. You also saw him doing that with the Ebola, with SARS, with H1N1, and with also with uh, Zika. H1N1 was very special back home. That broke out in 2009. And your institution, Texas Children's Hospital, set up a drive-through vaccine in a parking garage almost overnight to have those vaccines deployed. So again, thank you for being here. As Bum Phillips would say, you may have been a class by yourself, but every class you're in, it don't take long to call the roll. <laughs> I want to talk about you, qu quality treatments and future responses. First, quality treatments. Yesterday was announced that my home county of Fort Bend was the first site in Texas to have a confirmed case of H, I'm sorry, of the COVID-19 virus. The man, don't know too much, the man was 70 years old. He had traveled overseas, no confirmation, went to China, Iran, or Italy, and he's now quarantined in the local hospital. As Dr. Sell mentioned, a lot of people right now are living in fear that this disease is among the people of my hometown. And those fears may cause people to do something that's not very wise and sometimes very foolish. We've seen photos all across this country of towns reacting to this influenza. We've seen empty shelves at grocery stores. We've seen empty shelves of bleach. As you said, Dr. Sell, people think drinking bleach can somehow help control this virus, which is just crazy. We see empty shelves of canned foods. We see at the Home Depots, the Lowe's, all the masks and stuff that needed to protect people are getting swarmed up by people who don't need them. And Dr. Hotez, you brought this up yesterday on national TV. How can we make sure the required resources we have to fight back are given to the top priorities, which I think, as you mentioned, are probably, first of all, the families, the victim, their neighbors, the first responders, EMS vehicles, the cops, the firefighters, and also the doctors and nurses who take care of them. How can we make sure that those people have the first priority to get these scarce resources? So you, you've hit on it, right? I mean, that's exactly right. And thank you for those really generous comments. So we need to give our, our one, two, three, four top priorities of the groups that we're going to ensure uh, because if, if they go down, then everything falls apart and things go badly very quickly. And I don't know that we've, we've really done that yet. So I think, you know, protecting our older individuals in nursing homes, because uh, if, because we now know from Kirkland, any time a virus hits a community, those are the ones who are going to get hit the hardest, and, and the healthcare providers and others. The other thing I've been saying is, uh, regarding panic, is, I mean, look, you, you will have time. It's not like you're going to wake up tomorrow morning and find that the entire eastern half of the United States is infected. What, what we're going to see is multiple communities uh, being being affected, and that will cause a lot of concern. But you will have time in order to prepare and, and figure out what's happening. And we don't exactly know. It may stop there. Um, you know, there's some who believe there may be seasonality to this virus. We don't know that uh, at all because it's a new agent. So I think it's the the key is to stay in con. Our leaders need to stay in contact with the people. Hold those White House briefings uh, on a pretty regular basis. But also try not to sugarcoat, right? To be, it's it's a real art to be able to uh, give difficult information, but to do it in a way to say we're we're aw we're aware of it. Here's what we're doing about it. And I think I think you know we've we've been through this before. The, you know, one of the things that I've noticed in the 20 years that I've been following pandemics, it started with anthrax in 2001, then SARS in 2003, uh, H1N1 2009, as you point out, Ebola 2014. Uh, and then we go to Zika, and now this, the same thing happens uh, every time. It takes us a little bit of time to get our arms around it. There are always stumbles uh, in the beginning, and a lot of that has to do 
with the, the federal government and the state governments have to figure out all over again how to work together. So there's always seems to be that, that new relationship building that has to happen. And then eventually we get it right and, 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 and this will happen again. So, um, and that's I think the other thing that we wanna see is the press not piling on too much when mistakes happen. Good luck happen. with that. <laughs> yeah, I know, and well, especially it's occurring right during the Democratic prime. It's the, you know, it's happening in the worst time possible uh, from that sense. But, and to have that perspective of time saying, look, this, this always happens with, I mean, it's the, thank, it's thank the hardest you, thing Hurt. our country does. Thank you, Dr. Yeah, here Hurt. the gavel may have um, some questions for the record on stockpiling uh, vaccines. Thank you very much.